Longus. <coughs> and he's going to talk to us about North Korea and his personal experiences there. While he was on military duty in North Korea, excuse me, South Korea, uh, he had the opportunity to do something that few people are able to do. He walked into North Korea while wearing a uniform of the United States Navy, and he lived to tell about it. Ten years later, on the morning of Friday, April 27, 2018, North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un walked into South Korea wearing his dark uniform, a pinstriped Mao suit, which is a direct reference to the legacy of his grandfather Kim Il-sung, who founded North Korea. The setting of these two events was the same, the border between North and South Korea, within the joint security area. This area is the only portion of the Korean demilitarized zone and, <clears throat> excuse me, where North and South Korean forces stand face to face. Although Lonius was under direct orders to avoid making eye contact and any gestures towards the North Korean soldiers, it was often unavoidable as North Koreans would peer in through the conference room windows from the outside to see if any Americans or South Koreans were inside and if it was safe for them to enter. At times, the eyes and faces of the North Koreans reminded Lonius of those who he knew in the South, especially the children. His name unit visited weekly at an orphanage or the students he taught to speak English with a slight Texas accent at a private school. It is this next generation of Koreans who inspire Mr. Lanius to volunteer with Nehemiah Global Initiative, a global nonprofit NGO established by missionary Keith Bai, who was detained in North Korea for two years. It was founded in 2016 to protect vulnerable refugees of various nationalities. NGI Seoul headquarters was established in October 2017 and since then has been ceaselessly working to rescue North Korean defectors and help them physically and spiritually establish new, excuse me, establish new lives in South Korea. Please welcome Kirk Lanyan. Thank you for that introduction, Fran. First, I'd like to recognize any active reserve or military veterans in the room. If you've served or are serving, would you please stand or raise your hand? I'd just like to thank you for your service. As I get my slide prepared here, I want to say when we talk about Korea, there's many adjectives that come to mind, and one in particular would, would be complex. And I think that when we're dealing with complex problems at any, any point in our lives, when, and I'm sure many of you have been in situations where you felt you had no idea what the answer is going to be, and where did you turn? I know talking to this group, you probably turned upward. That's, that's where, where I turn as well. You know, the enemy tries to attack us when we're doing the right things, don't, doesn't it? You know, even my computer right now is having its little little issue, it'll, it'll finish up here in just a moment. I'm gonna get my PowerPoint up. But I'd like to just start off with, a, as you all already have, um, with a really brief prayer. So if you'll join me. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for bringing us safely here this evening on this uh, topic of Korea. Lord, we ask that you would just open our minds, open our ears, and open our hearts, Lord, um, to learning the truth. Um, and that starts with you, Lord. We ask that you would Bless the people of the Korean Peninsula, and especially those in the north. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So first I'm going to show you just a little bit about my background. And this began as a Navy reservist. I was assigned to the... Uh, 7th Fleet Reserve Unit, which was basically tasked with the defense of the Korean Peninsula. And the question here is Korean reunification, question mark. I'd like to cover basically a brief history of the church in Korea. As a result of the Russo-Japanese War in 1904-1905, Korea became a colony of the Empire of Japan. And it's important to note that Korea had not lived under foreign rule since before its unification in 668 AD. There was a great Pyongyang revival in 1907, but quickly a lot of the Christian influence was wiped out when the Japanese 
took over around 1910. And Pyongyang was actually known as the Jerusalem of the East. And of course, the Korean War raged on from 1950 to 53. Approximately 5 million soldiers and civilians lost their lives. Armistice was signed on July 27, 1953. And of course, we know the 38th parallel was basically put in place, separating North and South Korea, leaving us with this demilitarized zone, which is not the line itself, but a, a zone of several miles that stretches from the East Sea to the West Sea. And this is uh, when I was on duty uh, for Naval Forces Korea, I worked in information technology and I was tasked with uh, keeping communications intact for our liaison officers, who was a Navy officer. You've probably seen this location. It's where Kim Jong-un met President Moon of South Korea right across that line just a few months ago. The uh, DPRK population estimated 25 million, but probably much less than that. We don't know how many people have died in recent famines. Republic of Korea to the south, population of about 51 million. We're, we have 35,000 approximately US troops there, 39,000 more in, in Japan. And the Seventh Fleet area of, of, of activity, we have many ships, submarines, also Guam, and then multiple commands in places like Thailand, the Philippines, and Singapore. Now my service as a Dallas police officer was interrupted by initially Navy Reserve duty that, then took me to active duty, and it was really my honor to serve beginning in 2005 uh, through 2008, and actually living in Korea for those three years. I also had the opportunity to uh, tutor kids in English. My Navy unit had an orphanage we would visit every week in Seoul, and just really fell in love with the Korean people, the culture, and the food. And then uh, when, I, when I left my unit there, I was uh, selected as a chief petty officer. Most of that was from my experience in Korea, so a lot of fond memories there. There we are at the uh, orphanage in Seoul. And this is quite a few years ago, so these kids are probably teenagers now. And then even here in Dallas, I've stayed active. Yes, I've served as a, a Korean general. I guess uh, the next speaker, Peter, he didn't even know that. Um, so, I, I stay active in a lot of the Korean organizations, and I've been studying the language since 2005. And I'm going to talk about two people tonight. One is Dr. John Geisler, and he's the one that set up the nonprofits um, that I'll tell you about tonight. And the other is an individual that I'm going to introduce to you via a video. And I think you will have heard of this person. Um, going back to 2012, I was invited to go on a tour which would have actually taken me into North Korea. Let me drop the PowerPoint. And I decided at that time actually to run for Dallas County Sheriff. And so I was a Republican candidate for Dallas County Sheriff in 2012. But God just had better plans for me. And I didn't win that election. I got 42% of the vote against Lupe Valdez. And I hear that she's actually running for something this year. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so really I focused back on helping support missionaries um, through my church. So somehow my folder got closed. So if you bear with me for just a moment. But yeah, God just put it on my heart to support missionaries. And so I started going back to Korea in my business pursuits. So I broker telecommunication services and I go to Japan and Korea uh, pretty frequently. And it opened up opportunities when I wasn't uh, involved in business pursuits there to go back to the orphanages and, and meet up with some old friends. And God introduced me uh, to Kenneth Bay. So let me let me open this and hopefully it'll. I don't want to close the next slide because that's your presentation. There we go. Oh, I got to get it out of full screen. Sorry, I'm not a professional speaker. In case you haven't noticed, but bear with me; it gets better. We thought it would be safer to put everything on one computer tonight. Let me close that. There we go. And now I need to minimize the PowerPoint. I think I just 
just need to get out of the, the uh, full screen mode. Inside the secretive country in the new book, Not Forgotten. Only on CBS This Morning, he showed Margaret Brennan how he now views his imprisonment as a blessing. Margaret, good morning. Good morning. Well, Kenneth Bay had made 18 trips to North Korea, and as a foreigner, each one was as dangerous as the one before. But in 2012, he was arrested and accused of trying to overthrow the government. He became the first American sentenced to hard labor and the longest held since the Korean War. He was left wondering if anyone was going to come save him. They called you prisoner 103. It's still stuck in my head. And I, I feel like I'm carrying this badge of 103 in my chest of, um, forever. Before he was taken prisoner, Korean-born Kenneth Bay was a preacher and missionary. He grew up in a tight-knit family in California and went on to start a tourism business bringing Christian groups into North Korea. But he made a fateful mistake. In 2012, he brought in a computer hard drive loaded with prayers and pictures of starving North Korean children. They said that you attempt to overthrow the government through prayer and worship. And they really took uh, prayer as a weapon against them. Any criticism of the regime is forbidden. Supreme Leader Kim Jong-un and his family consider themselves gods. He was arrested, charged with espionage, and sentenced to 15 years hard labor. One of the prosecutors told me that I was the worst, most dangerous American criminal they ever apprehended in, in since the Korean War. Uh, and I said, why? And they said, because you put, not only you came to do a mission work on your own, you asked others to join. Bay's fate was now in the hands of a young and brutal dictator scorned by the U.S. for carrying out a series of underground nuclear tests. Tensions with the U.S. spiked. So you were a political pawn, you believe? I believe so. You write about the trial, all of America really was on trial with me. Yes. What did you mean by that? I believe that they blame everything um, wrong with their country uh, to America. They said the reason for poverty, the reason for their suffering is all caused by U.S. foreign policy against them. And therefore, by indicting me, um, they were indicting the U.S. They spent nearly two years under 24-hour watch by 30 North Korean guards. The conditions were dire. He shoveled coal and worked the fields. He lost 50 pounds and was briefly hospitalized. I'm looking at the mirror in, uh, at the, in the bathroom every day and say, remember your missionary, this is why we're here for. Uh, I took it as more as a um, blessing rather than a curse or uh, suffering. You're in a labor camp. Yes. And you thought that was a blessing? Well, it's very hard to, for me to even say that right now. But no one likes suffering. No one really embraces suffering. But when suffering comes to you, uh, you have to face it. Kim Jong-un finally issued a pardon in 2014, after the White House sent U.S. Intelligence Chief James Clapper to pick up Bay and another prisoner. Bay said he'd never been so proud to be American. I was just overwhelmed that, um, that after being there for 735 days, I was finally going home. Bay says he's not angry about his imprisonment. He believes it was an opportunity to share his faith and teach his guards what life is like outside of North Korea. I was just there to love the people, let people know that God care about them and the rest of the world care about them. I hope that this book becomes a reminder of the people to not forget the people in North Korea 
have more compassion for the people who are living as a prisoner in their life. Now, 21-year-old student Anna Warmbier is currently facing a similar 15-year hard labor sentence, and Kenneth told us he has reached out to his family and he is advising them to speak out because uh, Kenneth and his family believe that made a big difference in his case and in basically helping to secure his freedom. It's amazing that he can go through what he went through and still come out and talk the way that he has. Yes. But that he, he sees it as a blessing. He said he laughed at that. Thinking of some of his guards as friends. Yeah. yeah. Betty He's showed the them first American they'd ever met. Thank you, Margaret. Did you catch her there at the end? She said, yeah, that he showed them love. Even CBS News can talk about love sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> they can get that right. In the interest of time, I'm going to kind of rush through the last part. Um, I really wanted to just introduce myself tonight and offer myself as a speaker. Many of you have organizations that would like to have a presentation about this Nehemiah Global Initiative. I'll be going back to Korea at the end of the month for two weeks. As you could have guessed, the, the schedule for things is being rapidly accelerated because we really don't know where things are going. Mike Pompeo, our Secretary of State, is there now. And we really need to pray for our leaders. And frankly, we need to play, pray for even for Kim Jong-un. The, the four uh, areas that are covered in, in this organization's mission are as follows, and I'm going to go through this very quickly. You can actually go to the website that's on the page on your, on your chair. It's ngikorea.org. But really, first I'd like for you to stop at pray, the number four, nk.org, and sign up to be one of our prayer warriors. Because I think you would agree that prayer is the strongest um, action that we can take. And just as the, you know, we, we should be able to uh, take action in many, in many ways. Uh, because the Bible says that faith without works is. So the ways that we can help are to remember, to rescue, to restore, and to rebuild. So I'm not going to go through, I'm going to save this presentation for uh, the times that I'm hopeful that many of you would reach out to me. And I'm sincere about this. I, I do this on my own time when I'm not working. Um, I'd like to come speak to your church groups. To I've already been invited to speak to the Texoma Patriots Tea Party group coming up on July 23rd. And let me leave you with this call to action. On your chair is a sheet that has my contact information. On the front, it gives you very concrete ways that you can help. Nehemiah Global Initiative is a 501c3 organization. So your donations are tax deductible, and I've given very explicit instructions on how you can donate. Also, a letter from, or an email from Kenneth Bay to me, and it has his email address, as well as Dr. John Geisler, who's um, involved with the organization that helped him structure it as a 501c3. So if you want to reach out to them with any questions, I would encourage you to. And, um, ask them about me as well. And then lastly, if you'd like to donate to uh, help cover the cost for my um, upcoming trip, and maybe if some of you would like to go, if any of you have taught English before, ESL and any type of setting like that, I'd like to talk to you. I'll stick around after the presentation. But let me leave you with this brief uh, video to close out, again, as a call to action. And if you know uh, the book of Nehemiah from the Bible, you'll understand the message that's, that it conveys. And once this is finished, I'll be done. And thank you for your time. And I would covet your support.
100만 명이 한 사람들이 전 세계에서 북한을 위해 기도하고 북한을 위해서 우리가 기억하며 함께 섰을 때 하나님께서 저를 구출한 것처럼 저 2,500만도 하나님께서 그들을 구출하시고 회복하시고 다시 살 것이라는 마음으로 이 캠페인을 시작하게 되었습니다. 이 is starting the prayer campaign to pray for the 20 to 25 million people in North Korea. And this again is pray for nk.org. So if you'll go to that website and register yourself as a prayer warrior, it'll track daily and show exactly where in the world people are praying for the North Korean refugees. Approximately 25,000, actually closer to 35,000 have escaped from North Korea through China and made a very treacherous journey through countries like Laos and Vietnam and others and then made their way back up to South Korea. Many North Korean women are sold to Chinese men and then, of course, when babies are born, the women are often separated from their children and those children are orphaned. And so, Nehemiah Global Initiative operates this orphanage called J House and it, it is there to take care of the Chinese Korean children born in China who've lost their parents and to show them the love of Jesus Christ. And I'll be traveling there too in coming months as well uh, to assist with that. The needs are great and there are several hundred former North Koreans who are training, learning intensive, uh, through intensive English training, job skills training in South Korea. And they will be the vanguard of those to go in and to provide humanitarian assistance whenever it may open up. Here they're praying over a Bible that will be donated. They prepare to deliver one million Bibles to North Korean citizens within 30 days after unification. Now if you'll go to ngikorea.org, and again, it's on the sheet on your chair, you can study each of these areas and pray about which ones you'd like to assist. There are also camps that are held not just for teaching English, but to basically grow leadership. These are camps where young, both South Korean and North Korean students are able to interact together and it, it's just, I can't even describe in words uh, how important that is. So many times we're presented with information about places in the world where the needs are great and the only option for us is to donate. And while that's important, again, I would put prayer at the top of the list and then if you'd like to assist us materially or even pray about going with us uh, to perhaps participate in some of the programs, I'd like to see you uh, join us as well. You can donate airline miles, you can uh, make donations directly to the organization, or just by following the instructions on the sheet. And with that, I'm finished. Thank you for your time.